If it feels like Florida is experiencing more and more virulent examples of hate speech, it's because it is. A new investigation finds that extremists are moving to the state as part of what's being called ideological migration. This nationwide trend has accelerated during and since the pandemic and has continued to grow under increasingly partisan political regimes. I'm joined now by frequent contributor Claire, Claire Goforth, a lawyer and longtime Jacksonville journalist and editor who now works as an investigative reporter for the digital newspaper Daily Dot. Welcome, Claire. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, are you seeing increased anti-Semitism or racial intolerance on the First Coast? What actions would you like to see from state or local leaders? Join our conversation. Give us a call at 549-2937 or email firstcoastconnect at wjct.org. You can also message us on Facebook and Instagram or tag us on X at FCC on Air. Claire, this four-part series began publishing this week. Explain what the focus is and how you got started working on this project. So the idea for the story started last summer when we heard about a neo-Nazi who had relocated to an area in northern Maine, Christopher Polhouse of the Blood Tribe. Uh, we thought, you know, let's go up there. Let's see what's what's the lay of the land. How is the community reacting? And through the um, conceiving of that story, we really realized, and as a longtime reporter on far-right extremism, uh, what we've been seeing over the years is that they're moving to places where they feel that they'll be welcome where they feel that they can make a difference on the political landscape and the culture itself. And this is going on nationwide. Um, and so we thought we can't just do one story about this. We need to do this story as a like a national story, go to different places around the country where this is happening and just, you know, ask around, talk to people, see how they're reacting to it and what's going on. So we ended up going, I went to Northern Maine, as I said, um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, I went back to West Virginia, where I'm from, and also did some reporting here in Florida, where I live. And, you know, we find, I found that in each community, they're reacting differently. Each community, it's sort of a different animal. Um, the way that the extremists are infiltrating the community, they're having various levels of success in each place. And you find a resistance in all of these places, but you also find a receptive audience in all of them. Um, I would say that the most receptive audience has been, unfortunately for me, as I'm from there, has been in West Virginia. Um, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho extremists have been very successful at infiltrating the Republican Party. Here in Florida, it's a little bit different because what you see on the local level is a little, I would say that the tide is against them. Um, on the state level, it's different, however. On the state level, you know, you see and I'm not saying that Republicans are extremists. I'm just saying that there are a lot of extremists in the Republican Party and the Republican Party of Florida by waging these major culture wars on issues that really white supremacists and people on the who are far right radicals also, you know, feel the same way about LGBTQ rights and black history and things of that nature. Uh, you know, they send signals to them that says that, you know, you stand for what I stand for. They may not agree on every issue, but when they see things like the don't say gay law, as it's been dubbed, they think, well, yes, I support this. So keep doing that. Are there any I know you say there each place that you looked at is a different animal, but is there any demographic similarities to the place itself in terms of the size of the place or the racial and ethnic breakdown? Typically, what I see is that they're going to very white places. Every community except for Florida is heavily white. Maine, West Virginia, Idaho are very white states. The areas in which that they're specifically moving are extremely white, extremely conservative. Now, Florida is a much more diverse state. So because of that, Florida attracts a particular crop of extremists. What we see is that it attracts a type that likes confrontation, that that's part of their MO. You know, they really enjoy doing these confrontational things, and they do that so they can create content. Because many of the ones that we see in Florida, and we have people who live here, we have people who specifically come here just to do that, that don't live here, who are extremists. They come so they can film it, and they can put it out there on their various channels that they're on in order to get eyeballs and to get money from their supporters in almost every single case. And does um, putting out an event that happens in Florida naturally generate more heat and light than an event that perhaps you've staged in a smaller area? Absolutely. I mean, Florida has an outsized um, presence in the, in the media, particularly politically. Um, you know, the former president lives here, one of them. Um, another presidential candidate who's still in the race, our governor is here, uh, Florida, and there are just so many 
really prominent conservatives who have made Florida home in recent years. I mean, didn't Sean Hannity from Fox News just said that he's here? But then we also have, you know, all these really weird right wing wackos in Florida. And we have had for a long time. But, you know, when you see something like the Proud Boys were formed here, the Oath Keepers were formed here, that tells people who maybe have their own group that, you know, because these groups, they tend to, their, their membership tends to be a little bit transient in that they'll, they'll belong to this group for a while, but, you know, infighting or they'll just, it won't be quite right for them. They'll switch to a different group. We see a lot of movement in between the groups like that. So if you're somebody who is, you know, a right-wing influencer, a, you know, a hateful right-wing influencer, you're going to think to yourself, well, you know what, there's probably a ready audience for me. I can get some people to show up for these events and, you know, wave, uh, swastikas and do Hitler salutes, sadly. So this four-part series, um, I've read now one installment in full, another one published today. The segment on Northeast Florida, Florida, has not yet published. What are we seeing here? What does your report find? You, you did send us an embargoed copy of that, so we've had a chance to look at it. Yes. So what we're seeing here is that we have two very active, two groups primarily that are active in the community the National Socialist Florida, and then there's this Goyam Defense League who is led by this influencer, John Manadio. Um, he is originally from California. He moved to Florida specifically because he said that he thought it would be more welcome, welcoming to him. Um, he was chased out of California. He told a reporter who went to interview him one day that he was ruining his life. Um, although many would argue that by expressing anti-Semitism, being a Holocaust denier, you're ruining your own life. But, you know, that's his, his position. Um, so we see them here. They were doing the laser light displays, the anti-Semitic laser light displays during Florida, Georgia in 2022. Um, also on downtown buildings. And we see flyering. We see banner drops. Um, that that is so far, that is really, it's those type, they're just propaganda. But you know, how long before it becomes something more than that? Because even if, you know, you're the leader of one of these groups and you don't, you never do anything violent. And John Manadio is very clear. He says he's not a violent person, although he does use a lot of violent imagery and things that, you know, beget violence in many people's minds. They may never do anything, but people who are consuming this content and becoming radicalized by it online, they may in turn commit a violent act. And a tragic example is the Dollar General shooting. That shooter in his manifesto expressed um, admiration for the racist Charleston church shooter. And I know for a fact that that shooter was specifically radicalized online. He never even attended a meeting with a hate group as far as anyone knows. That is the risk. People say these things online they say that people deserve to be killed because of who they are, because of the faith that they have, because of who they love. And other people take that as a, they take that and someone who has serious mental health issues, someone who is just a sick, depraved individual may actually act on what they're seeing, what they're reading online. We're talking about extremism um, rising in Florida and uh, Northeast Florida in particular. We're talking to Claire Goforth. If you have questions about her four-part series, Nazi Land, or if you uh, or have experienced some of this your, in your own life, please give us a call at 549-2937 or send an email to firstcoastconnect.wjct.org. You can also reach out on social media. So this trend that you are reporting on, Claire, has been documented by demographers, including at the Anti-Defamation League. Um, they've found that Florida is now a haven for right, far-right radicals. Um, and it's worth noting that more people were arrested from Florida in the January 6th insurrection than any other state in the country. Um, so this is perhaps a, a welcoming state, the ADL finds. What is it specifically about Florida's political landscape that someone might find welcoming? A couple of things. One, there has long been a network of white supremacist groups in Florida. Um, then the fact that our Republican-dominated government keeps passing these laws and pushing for these laws that they take as a sign that they are welcome here, that they share the same beliefs. You know, all of this uh, culture war stuff that they've been doing about books and being gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, you know, trying to make it a crime for children to go to drag queen story hour, essentially, 
all of those things really appeal to white supremacists. They are very homophobic and transphobic. They're misogynistic. Um, when you make the state school curriculum teach that some slaves benefited from slavery because they learned a trade, um, they see that as, you know, they, they, that to them is saying that slavery was good. That is what they take from that. Um, any number of other things that you see our Republican politicians say and do really do appeal to them. An example locally would be the legislation that Representative Dean Black has proposed that would make us basically put up back all the Confederate monuments and also go for much further than that, find the, the uh, public officials who voted to do so uh, and remove them from office. Now, I will concede that that legislation does not have very much of a chance of passing. He proposed similar legislation that did not go as far last year and it didn't even make it out of committee. That will probably happen again. But if you're somebody who is racist, um, who worships the Confederacy, and a lot of racists do, you see that and you think, well, that is something that I can get on board with. And if you live somewhere else and let's say you live in a blue city or a blue state, um, that has preserved reproductive rights, that has protected the rights of the LGBTQ community, that really has taken a strong stride towards equality for other pe people of various races and religions, you know, and you don't like that because typically what these people are white and they are typically men. Um, you think, well, man, I'll go to Florida because there they're going to put back up that statue of a slave owner who fought to keep slaves and they're going to try to keep down the LGBTQ community community. They're going to take women's rights to uh, reproductive freedom. And these are all policies that I support. When it comes to things like book bans, um, which may not necessarily speak directly to like a racial motivation, but definitely, as you say in your piece, come right out of a fascist playbook. Um, it, there also seems to be this trend towards um, sexualizing uh, or portraying enemies as, you know, trying to sexualize children or be hypersexual themselves. Is that also a tool uh, traditionally of, of, a, of a fascist um, entity? Or is that something that's kind of unique to the current crop of, you know, white supremacists and, and um, hate groups? You know, I think that is really a page from the fascist playbook, to be frank. Um, because in our society, there are really, and you'll be talking about someone who has been convicted of this very crime later on the show. Um, there really are there a few categories of things that people can do that make them utterly irredeemable in society's eyes. Preying on children is one of those. And so if you accuse someone of preying on children, you make them irredeemable. You make them so that there's just no salvaging that person in many people's eyes. They're vilified to such an extent that now you can, in their minds, get away with taking away their rights, with just being flagrantly homophobic and transphobic. Um, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, Hitler really went after the LGBTQ community very early in his regime. And it was the beginning, you know, people say that that famous saying about when they came for gay people, I didn't say anything because I wasn't gay. When they came for, you know, Catholics, I didn't say anything because I wasn't Catholic. And when they came for me, there was no one left. That's really what this is. You know, it's really the first steps towards that. Um, some of the hate groups that we have operating locally in Northeast Florida and statewide, they openly advocate for fascism. They don't even make any bones about it. Uh, you know, and when politicians fall into those hands, when they do these things that these people see as a signal that we're on the same side, it sends a message that let's bring fascism to Florida. We've got a call, Stanley, on the north side. Good morning, Stanley. Welcome to First Coast Connect. Yeah, Happy New Year's to everybody. Uh, Y'all doing a fantastic job. Uh I am a little appalled by the fact that we are talking as if this is something new. I've been around a long time. I go back because I was downtown when they did Axe Handle Saturday. Just imagine all the oppression that's taking place to the African-American community. And at this present time, you're talking as if it's just been all about Caucasian. We've been dealing with this all our life. I'm talking about African-Americans. 
just imagine about the uh, the the uh, issue that we have to go through. And then when in the back early in the nineteenth in the sixties back then, a lot of those racist Caucasian women took corporate America and the government. You have it right here in Jacksonville, right today when it comes to redistricting. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. What of that, Claire? Um, what is what is new that we're talking about here that isn't something that we've seen in the South and in Florida for a while? It's back. Really, is the, the, the main point is that it's back. You know, it, it didn't go away entirely, for sure. No one would argue that. But it did, you know, this hateful white supremacy really did go much more underground for several decades. There always were hate groups, and, you know, I, my heart just goes out for him, to, the experience that he must have had being at Axe Handle Saturday, the carnage and the racism. It's just horrifying. And in this story that we'll publish on Thursday in the Daily Dot about the rise of extremism in Northeast Florida and what it looks like, I do report on the KKK marching in Jacksonville in 1964 um, and Axe Handle Saturday and the fact that we had the park across from City Hall named for a Confederate soldier until just a couple of years ago. Um, there are these symbols of hate. There were these hateful acts that were going on here throughout time. And while it did go underground in the more overt sense, you know, people weren't taking access to um, black people indiscriminately. And there's a lot of ins and outs there. I'm not going to say that it's a hard line in the sand that there wasn't violence as there has been. Um, what really was going on in the, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s and 2000s more was like systematic oppression uh, via a uh, disenfranchising people uh, with redistricting and uh, consolidation of the city and county, which is widely acknowledged to have partially been motivated by a desire to take away power from the black community because the city proper was fixing to be a black majority. And they thought that the city would and correctly probably would have not uh, voted a black mayor into office within the decade. And instead, it took 40 years before we had a black mayor when Alvin Brown um, you know, the, they used tools of oppression uh, via the uh, schools to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, disenfranchisement, uh, felon, felony disenfranchisement to take power away from the black community. But what we see today is people who are marching in our streets and saying death to Jews and saying that we should string them up, that people are, you know, sending me death threats and saying that I should be shot because I report on these things. Um, it's in our face now. And I'm not going to justify mass uh, disenfranchisement or any of these tools of oppression. But it's one thing to use legal and evil maneuvers to take power away from a people based on the color of their skin and to oppress them. And it's another to actually advocate for people to be mass executed. And you have had to occupy a really difficult space as a journalist um, because you were, first of all, required to be in some very difficult conversations, um, witnessing them, you know, because of the, the online communities that you're profiling and following. So you're on a lot of platforms that some of us would probably just as soon avoid. Um, and you've also been, you know, as you say, targeted, um, threatened because of the work that you do. Um, first of all, I just, you know, personally interested in how you deal with that, how you cope with that. And then as a, as a second question, just is there a concern, you know, that giving these groups the oxygen and the, um, and the ink, you know, gives them more traction than perhaps they would otherwise have? That is always a concern. And it is something that I think about a lot as I report on these things. I mean, some blow hard on the internet, just sounding off and spewing hate into the world and nobody's engaging with it is one thing, but when you have thousands of people consuming your content, like each of the individuals and groups that I profile in this series, then your influence is growing and you do need to, you, we can't just ignore it. You know, you have to, there's a balance there. Um, you don't want to make their star, but you also don't want to ignore them until they become a supernova, I guess, right? Um, I'm very careful about who I choose to write about and, um, you know, I just I feel that it's important that we pay attention to this. But with each of these stories, it was really important to me 
to center the narrative on the community, the community that's pushing back against this. I certainly gave every single story subject a fair opportunity to uh, answer my questions and plenty of time to do so, to deny that they believe something. Um, most of them did not deny their belief, and none of them actually denied their beliefs, or they or they ignored me. Um, and it, you know that as journalists, it is important for us to give people a fair opportunity to comment. But it's also imperative that we try to have a little perspective about this, right? So John Manadio has 9,000 followers on one of his Telegram channels. That's 9,000 people consuming his content. But this is a state of 20 million people. Most people are good. Most people are not extremists like this. But when extremists get um, an ear with the people in power and they grow their influence online, they're radicalizing other people, they're changing our laws, they're influencing our laws at least. I mean, we have to pay attention. We have, you know, I I do feel like it's important to pay attention, but try to be balanced about it. And as to your question about how I handle uh, being in these spaces, you know, I don't really know. Um, I, it, it's, I'm, I'm resilient to it. You know, I, I don't feel like, what is the Nietzsche quote? I stared into the void so long it stared back at me. Um, that I don't feel like that is really a, something that's going to happen to me. Maybe it's because I grew up in a family where we had these conversations and um, my parents both were very, so very supportive of equality and would never shy away from having a difficult conversation about these subjects. So I just don't. I don't get affected by consuming the hate in that way. Um, when people come at me, I feel as though most of them are just paper tigers. There certainly is the risk that some of them aren't, and I do take th threats seriously, and I have conversations with my family about threats that I receive, and we make decisions on how to act, and I have conversations with my editors about this. Um, and, you know, there have been times that I have been terrified, you know, um, I have been very frightened at times, but usually not. Usually they're cowards in real life and they just like to go off on the internet. And I also feel as though as a white woman who grew up in a Christian household, I occupy a certain position of privilege. And if they're going to come at me, I'd rather they do that than go after people who are not in that position of privilege, um, people who are just innocently going about their lives because this is a choice I make to report on this beat. And I'm just, I'm kind of, I won't use any swear words on the, on the show, but I am, uh, let's just say that I think that they can suck an egg. <laughs> gotcha. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for sparing sorry, us the Sorry, sorry, audience. <laughs> um, you know, you're to your point, I mean, about when to ignore or, or to acknowledge the existence of these kinds of messages. Um, obviously, there are circumstances that you alluded to where it's definitely percolating to the surface in a way that no one can ignore. You talked about the um, Florida Georgia weekend when there was hateful messages, anti-Semitic messages broadcast on the stadium where that game was occurring, um, nationally televised. I didn't realize until going back and looking at some of your earlier reporting that those same messages that weekend had also been broadcast on the Castillo de San Marco in St. Augustine on the fort downtown. Um, and I hadn't seen that reported elsewhere, but you had pictures of it. It's, um, I think, an indication of how widespread that initiative was that weekend. There were also anti-Semitic banners being hung over um, interstate highways. Um, there was an airplane that had the message over the game, over the Jaguars game sometime around then mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And, of course, the, the Dollar General shooting that, that was a racist shooting that took the lives of three black people in Jacksonville. Um, obviously, a, a really horrendous example of hate hateful ideology manifested in violence. Yes, I mean, and you can draw a direct line from one to the other, really. And that is, that's the thing. I mean, this isn't just people, you know, being ridiculous online. This has a real potential of uh, inspiring acts of violence and hate. I know that there are local um, uh, synagogues and mosques that have experienced um, an influx of threats and just hateful bigotry towards them. Um, there was a bomb threat 
a couple of years ago, remember, Mm -hmm. Um, against a synagogue, I believe. Um, You know, the type of content that you see, this propaganda that's out there, you know, expressing all this anti-Semitism for thousands and thousands of people to see in live in person. Um, it does have an impact in that way. And I will say that it was cheering to many people who follow these types of things that the city council passed legislation cracking down on it right away. I mean, I, there is a certainly, uh, some people felt it took them a little bit too long and that they kind of, uh, drug their feet on it. Um, that they hadn't been really serious about pushing back against this rise of anti-Semitic content in, in Jacksonville. And there's some argument that they haven't done quite enough or even the police haven't done quite enough yet. Uh, but that was something that, and, and that, let me tell you what, the extremists were very mad about that. <laughs> and that's a good thing. When they're mad and they stop doing it, they stop putting swastikas on our buildings. That's a good thing for our community. Um, and as you speak of it, we did get just a message from Jimmy Peluso, city council member on X. Um, he said, I've been trying to work on anti-hate legislation since the massacre in Newtown, the Dollar General. Um, I continue to hit roadblocks because there are constitutional questions. I believe we are far beyond First Amendment rights when people are dying and I'm still intending to file something. Um, So there has been some movement on that front, um, but you say that the response overall in Florida and elsewhere has been rather tepid in terms of a legislative response. Yes, it's a it's a a mixed bag. Sometimes you'll see, you know, legislation like the one to crack down on the laser light things, and then you'll see them sort of turn a blind eye to other things. Um, you know, I feel like the existing litter statute, which was used against John Manidio in a different community, he spent 30 days in jail in November for distributing for distributing hate hateful litter. Um, you know, when you put out 300 pieces of plastic, well, that's 300 pieces of litter. And actually, Palm Beach County, where he was arrested, I had previously reported for the Daily Dot that um, hate flyers that had been distributed in that community almost were a dead ringer for hate flyers he sold. And then later on, they arrested him. Now, I don't know if one thing led to the other, but, you know, when you have an existing statute, just like, you know, not just the litter statute, but also the um, legislation that DeSantis signed cracking down on anti-Semitic hate speech, these things are already on the books. Enforce them. You know, you have the governor ordering his election police to go out and haul people in for voting, 14 of the 19 of whom were black. And don't tell me that's a coincidence. Um, you know, that's a law that you're choosing to enforce. And I don't remember how much he spent on that election police force, but it was a, in the millions. Right. Um, you know, yeah. how about we just like crack down on the, the hate, the anti-Semitic litter? that they, these groups typically will go to Jewish communities and spread them around. They'll go to black communities and spread around these hateful things. And Each we, one of those is litter, and they post about it online. Like, they post a photo of the flyers, and then they, and then they distribute them. I mean, I feel like, ah, you know, I am a lawyer. I feel like there's a, it's a little evidence, okay? Evidence, perhaps? And there have been a number of instances, with, you know, that we've heard about where neighborhoods are waking up to you know, bags full of like kind of rocks to weigh them down. They're just throwing them out of the window of a, of a car as they drive by full yeah. of hate, hate leaflets. Yeah. And if you post that, you're doing that on your Telegram channel like they do. Patriot Front's a really good example. They, I mean, you can go on their Telegram channel and search Jacksonville, Florida, and it'll all come up. It'll come up with photos of where they're spray painting and um, photos of where they're distributing flyers. You can do it with any of these channels. These people generally are not criminal masterminds let's be frank okay um they they post that they're going to do something that is technically a civil infraction and then they do it and i mean i feel like there's something there for the police to work with right so this four-part series claire first of all um when does the rest of it publish when does the florida segment publish and um what all like where can people find it people can find it on the daily dot.com uh we've Publish the Florida segment on Thursday. Tomorrow we're publishing the portion of the series about Northern Maine. Yesterday we published the portion about West Virginia, and today we have the one about Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, we did get an email from a listener saying, uh, have you watched the fall of Minneapolis documentary that came out last year? Amazing sad news on what was not covered originally with George Floyd. Made me wonder if we have enough brave reporters to investigate. It's a tough beat, Claire. Um, how many people out there are doing the kind of work that you're doing? 
It's a very small number, unfortunately, and we lose more of them all the time for many reasons. One of those is that the media is suffering generally, and a big reason is because it is uh, it creates an enormous amount of stress for many people. Um, you know, not everybody wants to get threats of sexual violence and th threats of being assassinated every time they publish something or have just, you know, the organizer of the Unite the Right uh, troll them on Twitter, which happened or X, which happened to me yesterday. Um, I understand why people don't want to stay in this beat. And that's why it's a very small number of people reporting on it. But it's really important work, in my opinion. And um, I wish that more people would pay attention. And that more resources would go to it. Um, yes. I mean, it is a tough time in the in the business uh, in, of mm -hmm. journalism overall. And I would imagine that that's a beat that, um, like you said, it's not necessarily one that people relish. Right. I mean, covering the kitten parade, as I like to say, is a lot more pleasant, isn't it? They're so cute and fluffy, <laughs> right? Uh, but, you know, we also have to pay attention. And it deserves coverage, okay? All you people out there, please cover the kitten parade. I need some content that will make my brain use, like, release dopamine. Um, but, you know, it's important to cover this. This is a, it's an overtly political story. And we're coming up on a presidential election cycle. The la when Trump was elected the first time, months later, racists descended on Charlottesville, Virginia, for the deadly Unite the Right rally. The second time, thousands of people assaulted good democracy and tried to overturn a fair and free election. Many of those people were hate from hate groups. They were from militias. About 10% of them were from Florida, as you said, the state with the highest number of J6 people arrested. What's going to happen this time? You know, he just blew the competition out of the water, as we knew, in Iowa last night. I don't really see his momentum slowing. Um, someone else just dropped out of the race, that really cringy billionaire. Um, you know, there's still Nikki yeah, Haley. And, me. I know his okay. name. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, you know, um, Ron DeSantis is still in the race and Nikki Haley are still in the race, but neither of them are pulling even close to enough. Um, you know, what is it going to look like? in this election season we're going to see a lot more uh of the far right being very visible very vocal and trying to grab attention for themselves and if nobody is paying attention and putting into context as we try to do in this business and show exactly how hateful they are and who they really are and how most people don't agree with them then they're just allowed to ch shout into their own echo chambers and attract people to their cause well, Claire Goforth, we so appreciate your reporting, the in-depth work that you're doing on this really difficult subject and all of the risks that you take to do it. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And you can find her four-part series on Nazi land at The Daily Dot. It will be publishing throughout the week, and there's already at least two pieces up.